Here's Goodnight Olive making her move to take the lead by ahead around the far turn. Ray's Kane has nearly 10 lengths to make up. So does Scooby Guando, verifying the leader. Top of the stretch, Tappet Trice is coming on to the outside. Up to the mark is running late behind Master of the Seas. Set piece down the center of the course. Master of the Seas alongside Annapolis. Here's a Luce Princess coming after Maj and Mission of Joy tries to find room between that pair. Maj has the lead. Mission of Joy second, a Lucy Princess third. The champ in front. Good night, Olive chased all the way. Tappet Trice! Tappet Trice wins the Toyota Bluegrass. And welcome in. Hope you're enjoying your Friday night. I'm Jeremy Plant from Horse Player Now. This is the Keeneland Look Ahead for Bluegrass Day on April 6th. The biggest day of the spring meet of the 16 we have. It doesn't get any bigger than this coming up for Saturday. And things got just a little bit bigger after opening day when there was a $66,000 carryover in the pick six. So nobody hit the pick six on opening day Friday here at Keeneland. That carryover goes into tomorrow's card, 66,544 into the Saturday program. Pick six will not be the final six races on the card. It will be starting in race number five and ending with the bluegrass. So races five through 10 will be your pick six races. We'll give you a look at the snapshot of the entire card. We'll also give you selections on the program. So stick with us here over the next half hour or so as we dig into an 11 race program tomorrow for bluegrass day. Things got off to a chalky start today and then got chaotic uh, second half of the card favorites won first uh four of the first five races on the program a second choice winning the other but then the back half of the card we had a bit of chaos no question about that as we had some prices galore so let's talk a little bit about what happened on opening day today to give you a sense of who's hot where things are working out uh and what we might look forward to onto the saturday program Rick Dutro got back on the beam right away in race number one. His 10-year suspension ended last year. He's back at Keeneland. He won the opening race on the card for his first win at Keeneland since the 2009 Shadwell Turf Mile. Wesley Ward was back as we always expect him to be in the two-year-old races. He won the two-year-old race early on the card with a horse named Shoot It True. Probably headed to Royal Ascot with this one. Dominant winner and a heavy favorite. $2.92 on the uh, paramutual payoff there uh, with the penny breakage another back for you on saturday was glenn gary or on friday glenn gary is back this is a horse who won the bowman's mill impressively last year it's a two-year-old sprinter came back today and won the lafayette stakes really look good and irad and todd are back they won uh they teamed up to win the ashland stakes three wins on the card for irad ortiz jr two wins for Todd Pletcher. And again, they teamed up with Leslie's Rose pulling the upset in the Ashland Six. We took a wild shot in the Ashland. I know our horse didn't fire at all, but another $20 mutual in the Ashland Stakes. That race just continues uh, to pop prices. Uh, hopefully you caught Leslie's Rose today from off the pace. One of the few off the pace winners, mostly speed, did well on the main track. That's what you expect at Keeneland. We talked about this last night. About 75% of the races are going to be horses forwardly placed. Uh, we had a situation in the Ashland uh, where there was a good pace in there. The closer came on. Uh, handicap the race for shape. If it looks like a closer can get there, you play the closer. But otherwise, you want to default the speed. Favorites, or I should say, horses with early speed went about two-thirds of the main track races in the United States flat out, period. So, you know, a track that's winning two-thirds, three-quarters with horses up front is not really too far out of the norm. So that's what we can expect here at Keeneland. Um, I was just starting to be a little concerned about the Gulfstream horses. All the horses I liked the first, you know, six, seven, eight races on the card from Gulfstream just didn't fire. And I'm starting to worry, you know, is the meat losing a little bit of its steam down there over the past couple of years at Gulfstream Park? Then all of a sudden, back-to-back -back winners in the stakes ranks, including uh, uh, the winner in the Ashland coming out of the races at Gulfstream Park. So uh, in, in the higher levels, the Gulfstream horse is successful. On the lower levels, the overnight kind of races, maiden allowance races, the Gulfstream horses didn't fire very well opening day. So it forced me to get into the database and try to figure out, is this something new? Is it too short of a sample size? It seemed last year that the Gulfstream horses weren't as dominant on the turf as they have been. And so I ran the numbers overall. Horses from Gulfstream won just under 16% at Keeneland Spring Meets from 2015 
to 2022, 15.9%, almost 16%. Last year, that dropped to 13.2%. So it was a pretty precipitous drop from almost 16% to 13% uh, for Gulfstream horses at the Keeneland Spring Meet. So that slide started happening last year. Let's keep an eye on it. Again, the higher level horses, I don't have a problem uh, with the Gulfstream runners right now, but I'm going to be a little bit leery in the maiden races, the allowance races. We don't get many Gulfstream claimers here, but maidens and allowances are where we're going to see a lot of the Gulfstream stream runners. I know my advanced handicapping tells me I wanted some of these horses this weekend. Now we adjust, right? This is what this is about. And this is why we do the look ahead podcast and analyze what's going on. Good day handicapping in the handicapper selectors box today for Scott Hazelton. He led all of us with four victories. Kim Nelson had three. Yours truly had two. First two on the card. Then I didn't do anything after that. So that's the way it goes. Short prices off the start, but uh, hopefully we'll have ourselves a bigger day today. All right, let's look ahead to the Saturday card. As we mentioned, we'll give you the snapshot of all the races here and how they line up and where the key wagers are on the program for Saturday. Here's a look at the Keeneland snapshot. Early pick five is going to start in race number one. Race number two is going to start the early pick four in the first of my three key plays. They are in orange. So you see races two, four, and five are where my key plays are going to come. They're early on the card. I think some of the stakes races line up with favorites a little bit later in the day. So maybe we can get some prices early on the program. Uh, pick six, again, with that $66,547,000 carryover, we'll get underway in race number five. Then our five straight stakes races go races six through 10. It's an all stakes pick five. The pick five is not the final five on the card, as we usually see on a typical race day. The uh, late pick five will be the all stakes variety races six through 10. That's the Commonwealth and the Appalachian, which will be the first of the Keeneland turf pick three races. The $3 Keeneland turf pick three on opening day today paid 6,800 plus. So if you could take that down, it's a very lucrative wager. Keeneland turf pick three will be on races seven, nine, and the 11th race finale. Uh, going through the other stakes, the Madison will be race number eight as the pick four. The Shaker Town in race number nine. Also, that will be part of the turf pick three. Then the bluegrass the big one in a race number 10 and a second carryover to talk about the super high five not a wager i play but if you're into the super high five 11,320 the carryover nobody hit it today the carryover 11,320 into the super high five in a race number 11 and that's going to wrap up that uh keeneland turf pick three rolling daily doubles pick three is offered on each and every card and got to remind you just the second day of the meet coming up that the reduced takeout in the daily double from 22 percent to 15 percent kicked into opening day friday that will be uh, uh offered all throughout the course of the meet more money back when you hit daily doubles again that seven point uh, reduction in the takeout is money back in your pocket and you got to get paid when you're right in this game that's what it's all about when you're wrong it doesn't matter what anything pays it's when you're right you got to maximize how much you get back. And that's why ticket construction strategy, weighting your opinions properly and getting some help in the better takeout wagers is all positives because that's when you feel it is when you get it back. When you put $2 on a horse and you don't win, it's $2 and it's gone. When you put $2 on a horse and it does win, how much did you get back? That's part of the things that you can control. You can't control the wins and losses in your wagering, but you can uh, control the returns. What kind of pools are you getting into? Are you making smart wagers? Are you not spreading your money too thin? So uh, use those uh, tools in your toolbox uh, to become a better horse player. That's what will hopefully help you with here on the program tonight and each and every night. Be sure to check us out, 8.30 Eastern. Okay, let's talk handicapping now. We've got the overlook of the card. Race number one, we're going to start off here on the program for Saturday. And the first on the card, we'll start the early pick five. Here are the picks at, uh, at the uh, Handicappers Consensus section at uh, the Keeneland website, keeneland.com. Go into the Handicappers Consensus, and you can get the pick for Scott, Tom Leach, myself, Gabby Gaudette, Kim Nelson. Again, Scott with four winners on the card yesterday, topped all of our handicappers. Handicappers. We get things started in one of the most formful conditions we have at Keeneland. These are maiden special weights going along on the dirt. In the spring meets, these races have about 55% favorites. Uh, overall, about 47% favorites, I think the overall number is. So these races are very formful. I'm not looking for any kind of prices in here. I think number seven, Batten Down, might be the favorite in here. If not the favorite, I think certainly a second choice, no worse than that. Three-year-old Colt by Tap It Out of Close Hatches. It's class on class. Bill Mott, the trainer here, and... Uh, 
and we'll see. The uh, Gulfstream horses, like I told you, didn't perform as well today in the uh, preliminary races as they did uh, when we got the stakes company. So we'll see if Batten Down can kind of reverse that a little bit. But certainly the top horse in here for me, number five, Elephant's Ear. The other one coming in from Fairgrounds with this one. Bullet workout for Kenny McPeak. And this is one who should like the distance. Kenny debuted this one around a route of ground. Ran against Cornishman. Was a nice race down there at Fairgrounds. A well-respected winner in that spot. Uh, you got to expect Elephant's Ear to run well in here. Kenny does well with his long-distance maidens at Keeneland typically, especially in the fall, maybe, but in the spring as well. And he's had a really good run with his three-year-olds this year down at Oaklawn and Fairgrounds. So Elephant's Ear should be well-placed here in this spot off the bullet workout. Seven and five the way I've got it shaken out here. And Elephant's Ear, the top choice for Kim Nelson as well. The six Eusebius and the eight Band for Life also get some love in this particular spot. The eight Band for Life stretches out from six furlongs. Got the outside post in here. Comes out of a good race at Fairgrounds, though, uh, against Drip. Uh, Drip was a really impressive winner in the career debut, a horse that we thought maybe would jump on the Triple Crown Trail, but had a minor setback. So Band from Life comes from a good race, but that was on the slop. we got to see this horse do it on the main track, on a fast track. We do expect conditions to be good for racing. Uh, fast track, good turf, I would assume, uh, what we're looking at. We didn't talk weather at the top of this podcast today, but we should have good racing conditions for tomorrow. Uh, weather looks better than it did for today, and it ended up shaking out not too bad today. So that's a look at race number one. We're going to take a look now over uh, to race number two on the card. It's going to be a six furlong allowance race here in the second. And this is going to be one of my key plays early in the day. Look, we're trying to catch some prices. Uh, I think the stakes race is a little bit later. You've got some really trustworthy horses, I think, in some of the main event races. So I'm going for a price in here. This is going to be one of my key plays of the day in race number two. It's going to start the early pick four, second leg of the uh, uh, of the uh, early pick five. And I'm going with number two in here, Bill Al. Bill Al is a good price, 10 to 1 in the morning line. I think this horse is going to have inside speed. Uh, there's not a, a ton of early gas in this particular six furlong race. And six furlong allowance races, this profile, you want to get to the front. If this one can make the front under Junior Alvarado, I think has a big chance in here. Comes out of the swale stakes, a class drop into the allowance company by Street Sense. First time here at Keeneland, but Street Sense had a really good year last year. His offspring won 25% on the main track so i expect bill Al to like the footing here at keeneland and that race last time in the swale came back very productive frankie's empire ladon bro grand mo the first they all came back in other stakes races and have acquitted themselves quite well uh didn't get any of the big candy in the florida derby but in the races between the swale and the florida derby those horses all showed that they had some class about them so i'm on the two in here bill Al cutting back in distance a little but i don't think there's that much early speed so if bill Al can get near the front Maybe sit a length or two off of it. Should be really effective in here under Junior Alvarado. The seven Guaner for Rick Dutra. We talked about him coming right back and uh, winning in his first start here of the meet in the opening race of the program. I would not be surprised if Guaner can run in this particular spot. This is a horse who's been well spotted since Dutra took over the training. Won the first three, including a stakes at Laurel, the spectacular bid. Uh, upset last time at Parks. They go to the blinkers here, so he makes an adjustment. Uh, has won one time, or run one time on a Fast main since Dutro took over, and that was a six-length win in a lounge company at Aqueduct. I would expect the seven Guaner to be very effective in this spot and one who has some speed and adds blinkers. So I think the seven and the two both can kind of get out to the front in this particular spot, and that's why I like them. Uh, the four Scatify is a router turning back to a shorter trip. Justify the sire in here. People kind of get excited to see Justifies the Siren. He's had some, you know, big horses, just FYI, who came back and ran a decent second. Uh, hats off to her. A good return race today uh, in the uh, Ashland Stakes for last year's two-year-old champion. But Justify hasn't had a winner on the Keeneland Dirt. I think it was 0 for 16 or 0 for 17 during uh, 2023. And so, you know, not that they're not going to turn out to be good here at Keeneland. We're not 100% sure how it'll all shake out uh, when the book is written about how good Justify's horses run. But the first 16 of them got the number here, 0 for 16 last year at Keeneland uh, for the Justifies. Now, if this horse had been here, been training here, and been stationed here, maybe you say, you know, look, we don't have anything to worry about. It's a lightly raced group. Not a lot of Keeneland form showing with these. But we don't have that with Scatify. It's a John Sadler trainee coming in from California, cutting back in distance. So we don't know about the distance. They do add Lasix in this particular spot. But I'm not sure if this horse is going to handle Keelan or not. And so at what is a short price in the morning line, I'm going to go against Scatify in race number two. And that's what makes it one of my plays of the day because you have a short price in the morning line. A lot of folks are going to jump on Scatify in this particular spot. 
but I'm going to try to beat him and I'll have a horse that I like at a price. So that's why it makes it one of the key plays of the day because it's not most likely winner and it's not just crazy as long shot. It's that intersection of we can beat a favorite and we have a good opinion on a horse who could be a good price. That's what you want when you're trying to figure out what your best bets on a card will be. And that's why I like uh, this horse, Bill Al, in a race number two. Certainly want to do an exact box with the seven uh, Guarner uh, and the uh, six Pirate. Certainly one that you want to consider in here as well for the exact is two, seven, and six, the way I see it uh, going across the way. I'm going to try to beat Scatify altogether in this particular spot. And if we do so, we're going to get paid. And that's what I talked about earlier. Get paid when you're right. That's what it's all about in this game. Third race on the card is a seven furlong maiden special. We'll just keep the picks right up here and move into this one. This is discreet mischief. Uh, we talked about a horse uh, chasing drip banned for life in an earlier race on the card uh, back in what? That, that was the second race, right? That um, was pirate. No, not pirate. Who, uh, who ran against drip here? And, we do this live, so sometimes we talk and we got to like look backwards. But uh, race number one was the horse who ran against Drip. I'm going to assume then. Yeah, that was the maiden race. Yeah. So if we see how this horse coming out of the Drip race, Banned for Life in race number one, that's who we're talking about. In race number one, Banned for Life is the eight horse coming out of the exact same race that the favorite comes out of in here. So we think it's a pretty live race. But the difference between race number one and race number three and why we like one of those horses come out of that key race and not the other is the distance, right? We don't know about the distance for Banned for Life stretching out uh, in race number one to the mile on a 16th trip. We do think that there will be no problem with discreet mischief for Brad Cox, the way he finished up up in that race uh, at fairgrounds behind the stakes bound drip. We know that horse is of stakes quality uh, coming up sometime soon when it gets back to work. Discreet mischief comes back at a very achievable distance. And that's why we like that one. But if you do see a good race from Ban from life in race number one, that's only going to enhance your opinion here in race number three. I think we're looking at a very short price favorite in here. Discreet mischief, as you see, Scott, Tom, myself, Gabby, all picking this one on top. Bookie Brent, the two, is the top choice for Kim. She's on the island here. Discreet Mischief, her second choice. This would be one of the shortest price favorites on the card. And in the early part of the program, I think this is probably the one short price favorite that you just want to accept. I, I don't think they're going to beat her in or beat him in this particular spot. So it's Discreet Mischief. Some really good pedigrees in here. The four Lieutenant General by Omaha Beach out of Lady Shipman. Uh, what a great pedigree that one's got. The eight, uh, Doro and Bridal by Medallia Dora out of Unbridled Forever. So we've got some serious. Serious pedigrees here. The 12 counter attack, just an $825,000 Keeneland September, Keeneland September yearling by Gunrunner for Steve Asmussen. So a lot to like in this particular spot. Seven furlong maiden special weight from a stat standpoint. Try to avoid the horses that are first time starters. We've seen 30 of these in the spring meets since we went back to dirt in 2015. 25 of the 30 winners were horses with experience. So only five first time starters have won these seven furlong maiden special weights in the spring, going the tough seven furlong trip. Give the edge to the horses who have experience in here, even though there are quite a few first time starters that are going to take some attention, including the aforementioned counter attack, that first timer for gun runner on the outside. But again, lean to experience based on the stats, and that's the way we'll do it. To the fourth race we go next, and we go back to the uh, uh, overview of the entire card with the snapshot. My second of three key plays uh, comes up in this particular race because we've got ourselves what could be a decent price in here in bridal up to the bar, 15 to 1 in the morning line. And this is the price shot in here because we've got a race that, you know, it's it's a six furlong sprint, only a field of seven. There's not going to be a lot of chaos in this particular race, you know. Sprints that have 10, 12, you know, 14 horse fields, there's a lot going on, a lot of people hustling and bustling and trying to get position and get out of the gate rodeo style and, and, and avoid the traffic. In this smaller field size, I just think a horse who can just – work their way to the front, kind of controls the race. There's not two or three or four horses to come make a run at you. And Bridal Up to the Bar, I think, can win this race on the front end. There's not much speed in here. And this one has shown some speed in the past on lesser circuits. Last time didn't run at all. A step slow coming out of the starting gate. So let's just act like that race didn't happen at all. That's going to help our price, obviously, coming off a seventh-place finish. But this horse needs to be up near the front. If Bridal Up to the Bar can break 15-1 to 1 in the morning line, I love that. 
And these small fields become cat and mouse games between the jockeys, right? When it's a big field, everybody's just trying to get position and hold it. These small field races, they're kind of conserving. They're looking. They're trying to find who the favorites are. Cat and mouse games. Jockeys ride this way. I like to look at the stats in small fields. And so I reduced it down to fields of seven or less, going six furlongs. And Corey Lannery is probably the best jockey at uh, Keeneland in this kind of situation in the cat and mouse game. He's got 20 wins in these kind of situations over the years on the Keeneland dirt. That's most of any other rider. And it's a 21% win rate in these kind of races. So that's easily the best. He's on at number five, bridle up to the bar. That's what makes this one a key play for me because small field sprint race, six furlongs, everything says you want front running speed. There's not much speed in here, so it's a pace play. Then you got the Lannery angle and the jockey that's just a little extra cherry on top. I don't like to bet, uh, uh, make a bet on a horse just on one stat angle. Usually it's kind of an emphasis. Is there a good fundamental reason to like the horse? And then do one of the stat angles kind of bolster your confidence or weaken your confidence in a particular horse? So instead of betting 10 to win on a horse, maybe you bet 20 because one of those stats and angles kind of gives you a little more bolster uh, in your opinion of them. That's the way I feel about bridle up to the that's why my second key play of the day comes in race number four uh, with that runner who will start uh, with the saddle towel number five. Now, look, miles ahead is my second choice in here. That's the favorite, Paul McGee for JMS Stable. Uh, right now, miles ahead, a top choice for Scott and for Tom, and also a second pick for everybody else. I think we're going to look at miles ahead being the uh, favorite in this race. And, uh, you know, we'll try to see what we can do in terms of getting a little bit better price. Nighttime, the four's got a win over the track coming from off the pace going seven furlongs. Has to try to get up going six. Going to have to get going a little bit sooner nighttime compared to that victory here in October. Tyler Gaffleyon rides nighttime. Gaffleyon got off to a good start today. I know I talked about him last night, how he was in a little bit of a funk at the end of the Gulfstream meet and the way he had the uh, previous weekend at Oakland. But he got off to a pretty good start here today at Keeneland. So that's good to see for Tyler Gaffleyon. It's always Gaffleyon and Saez that you're looking at at the top of the standings here at Keeneland. So. They look like they're off to the kind of starts uh, that you would expect from them here uh, in Lexington. Okay, fifth race on the card. Next up, uh, we'll go back to the uh, snapshot of the card because race number five is going to be my third and final of the key plays on the program. It's also going to start the pick six. $66,000 carryover in the pick six. Again, it is $1 pick six at Keeneland. Not the $2 pick six, not the rainbow with the 20 cent uh, jackpot provisions. This is a traditional pick six but with a $1 minimum, I've got a key play here in race number five. And because this is a race that has a long shot profile, we talked about favorites doing really well in race number one, which were dirt maiden special weight races going long here at Keeneland. This is the polar opposite. Race number five is a mile and three sixteenths on the turf. Turf route maiden special weights are the bottom of the reliability scale on races here at Keeneland. Favorites win less than 25%. It's 24 point something. Uh, you can check out the stats and trends block for the exact number. I don't have it written on my page here, but it's 24 point something percent winning favorites in turf route made in special weight races like this uh, in spring meets at Keeneland. So I have no problem trying to take a shot against uh, the logical horses in here and we'll try to get ourselves a little bit of a price. Now, when the morning line came out from Nick Tamaro, his numbers, I thought I was going to get a little bit bigger price on the 11 Tapakina in here. Uh, this horse is kind of a middling price, and maybe we'll get five, six to one. I don't think we're going to get a huge bomb in here, uh, but Tapakina is going to be my top choice and uh, picked the third by Tom in this particular spot. But I'm on the island, so maybe we'll get an up, uh, you know, an overlay price higher than the morning line offering is, is what an overlay means. And I think we will get that based on the rest of the handicappers consensus grid here because there's not any kind of uh, coalesced agreement with me on Tapakina. I thought this horse came out of better races against Speak Easy and BU. Again, I'm relying on this golf stream form and the maiden races. Today, that did not work out. It's a little too early to say no, and we need to avoid these kind, but I'm certainly less excited now than I would have been had I not seen the races today. Uh, but this horse was very even in sprint races, and those tend to stretch out. And I like the bottom of the pedigree. This is a tap it on top, but if you get down on the damn side of the pedigree, you're going to find Lord at War back a few generations. Lord at War was a horse who won the uh, Santa Anita Handicap, a great, uh, you know, long running uh, dirt horse on the West Coast. But he was prolific in producing horses for the turf that ran big at Churchill and Keeneland over the decades. 
You don't see him in the first line of the pedigree anymore. It's been a while. But as I was researching Tapakina, because I like the horse, I like the races that they were coming out of. So I started digging through the pedigree and I got back a little farther and a little farther. And all of a sudden I saw the name Lord at War. And I'm like, all right, now we're talking. There could be some turf in this horse's pedigree that just doesn't show up for a generation or two. Brian Lynch is going to give him a shot. We talk about Brian Lynch maybe being an under the radar trainer this meet. He got off to a rocking start at Gulfstream Park last December into January. Then the barn didn't necessarily tail off. He's still 21% for the year, but he was batting 38, 40% there for a while. So maybe they're ticking back in the right direction now after tailing off towards the end of the Gulfstream meet, saving some here to run. Uh, this one last race, March 2nd. So they didn't cram another start back in at the end of the Gulfstream meet. They waited for Keeneland. Now Tapakina gets a chance to go long. So I like a lot about this horse. I like the races Tapakina comes out of. I like the trainer cycle kind of maybe forming back here now uh, to having a big meet. You get Luis Sias, top rider here at Keelan, and I've got that Lord at War pedigree that we found uh, back away. So number 11, Tapakina, I'm on the island here. This is going to be one of my long shot plays of the day. Um, I just think the morning line is maybe too low on this horse. When I saw the line come out, uh, I, I print the past performances. If you see my past performances, I print them uh, before the lines come out. And so I'm usually writing the horse numbers in, and I don't even pay attention to the morning lines too much until it's time to like post picks and things like that. And I try to bounce off of the line and see what I've got. Uh, but I thought this horse was lower than what he'll actually go. I hope I'm right, and I hope we get a bigger price. So number 11, Tapakina, going to be one of my key plays of the day. Uh, that's where I'm headed in race number five. As for the other handicappers across the selectors box, uh, this race has got uh, the nine and the 10 as the other two logical players from everybody else. Stop the press, the 10, and our Tempest, the nine. I'm on 2 3 11, which, you know, doesn't get a lot of love across the way. So uh, either they're right or I'm right. But if I'm right, we're going to get paid in here with horses that uh, everybody else isn't on. So I've leaned to the Gulfstream horses on the turf in maiden races. That's historically the place to be. That's why I'm on the 11 3 2 here. That did not work at all today. So again, historical angles that have worked in the past may not you know, uh, reproduce. Uh, the Gulfstream racing might not be as strong as it once was, as we've talked about a little bit so far uh, on the uh, program and the podcast tonight. So we're going to give it a little more time, right? But it, you don't want to get hit too many times over the head in a 16-day meet. You learn your lessons pretty quickly. You don't want to overreact and let horses you like go. But for now, I still want to look for the Gulfstream horses in these turf maiden races. Uh, but we know we can find prices in these races. Historically, uh, you can get big numbers there. Again, the most least reliable favorites in all of Keeneland racing come in turf route maiden special weight races like we have in race number five. Let's get to the stakes now. The Commonwealth up next in the Commonwealth stakes is race number six. It's going to start the pick five and all stakes pick five in this particular spot. Three different horses in this race have won stakes races at Keeneland. So this is a seasoned group that has done good work here at Keeneland over the years. Uh, Manny Waugh won the Phoenix here in 2022. Uh, Ray's Kane's been a stakes winner here over the track at Keeneland. Hear Me Songs, the defending champion in this race in the Commonwealth, won this last year at 11 to 1 odds. Good looking group in here. I'm not quite sure where the public is going to definitely go in this spot, but the Colonel Power winner last time, number nine, Minnesota Ready, probably is going to get bet off a 102 buyer speed figure. The speed figures really talk on the tote, and that number just like stands out completely. Now, it stands out completely on the form of Minnesota Ready as well, 11 points higher than each of the last three starts, and looks like a, a career top buyer by about seven points. So, did Minnesota Ready uh, excel last time because it was an off-the-turf race and on a sloppy track? That's what my gamble would be. So I'm not taking Minnesota Ready uh, in this particular spot in the sixth. Then our other handicappers across the way are giving a little bit of love to Minnesota Ready, but nobody's quite trusting that sloppy track race and the big speed figure. But I think that horse will get bet. Race Kane will probably get bet too because this is a classy individual. Two-time winner here at Keeneland, a horse who ran in the Bluegrass Stakes, uh, ran in the Perry here in the fall meet and won the Perryville. This will be the first start since the Malibu on the West Coast trip for uh, trainer Ben Colebrook. Earlier in the week, uh, Tom Leach, the voice of the Kentucky Wildcats, does such great work here in the Handicapper Selectors box and for uh, Keeneland Select as well. He's got great interviews on YouTube. He talked to Ben Colebrook about this runner, Ray's King, coming back in the Commonwealth. Let's listen in. Ben Colebrook's got Ray's King in the grade three Commonwealth. Uh, off since uh, the day after Christmas, why'd you pick this spot for the next race? Ah, it's just a logical race to come back in. I mean, there was an allowance later on in the meet that if you needed a little more time, we'd try to go to that. But 
you know, he came on, came to hand pretty quick, and you know, seven furlongs at his home tracks kind of seems pretty like the right spot. How's he training? Training great. Yeah, I think he's really made the, you know, the move from three to four. He's filled out. He's a stronger horse. You know, last year he kind of, I mean, he had a hard campaign too, but you know, he wasn't really a real masculine type. You know, he kind of almost trained him like a filly, and he, you know, he struggled a little bit with some with this keeping weight on him, but. You know, since he's turned into a four-year-old, he's kind of become a man, so to speak. And, uh, no, he's been training great, real good works, and likes the track here, so we're excited. He's won at a variety of distances. Do you have a feel for what his best is? Well, I mean, I think he's never won a race around two turns. So, I mean, I, obviously, I think he is better around one turn. He's won at a one-turn mile, seven furlongs, and uh, twice. So, and, you know, he's run good around two turns. I mean, he almost won, the obviously, the, the Indian, Indiana Derby last year. So he can get... I think he can get two turns, but I do think the when the pace is a little bit more honest, you know, you can kind of come with that late run and just kind of wear him down around one turn where two turns, I think sometimes the horses with the tactical speed and they can slow it down and it makes it a little bit more difficult for him. For the rider, what's the, the key to getting Race King's best? You know, I think Louie fits him to a glove because he's one of those horses, the more you ride him and the more you kind of keep pushing on him, he'll keep coming and keep giving you more. So I think, you know, there's nobody that rides harder than Louie, in my opinion. You know, he's always he's always got him in the right spot, but he's always, you know, he's hard to get by in a finish, and he's strong as can be. So um, I think they just, the two of them kind of really fit each other well. Anything you're anything else you're excited about for opening weekend? Yeah, I got a couple in opening day, I think, that are both live. You know, one filly that's kind of going up the ladder. She won a cheap maiden, or, you know, maiden 7,500 at, uh, off a long layoff um, in the first race on Friday, but she's been training really well and was just second in the same kind of race, or sorry, third in the same kind of race at uh, at Turfway. So, um, you know, I think she's she's live, you know, running her on the dirt, which I think she'd probably be better for. She's a hard spun filly. And then I've got uh, Maiden in on Friday that, you know, she's she ran second to Kenny's filly that uh, came back and was second in the Bourbonette in her only start this year. And she she's you know run some really good races just hasn't won yet so but it's a tough race you know these maidens on the grass at keeneland are brutal so um but i think both of those will give a good showing anyway so ben colbrook will have race kane ready to go in race number six and uh got the wrong day's uh, handicapper selector box up there let's get to the right day this is back to saturday again the uh picks across the way in race number six race kane top choice in here for gabby and scott i'm going back to last year's winner hear me song kim nelson also has race kane a uh, picked on top tom uh, leach is on the island with bo cruz we told you when tom's got a long shot give it a second look so go back and uh, do a little extra handicapping maybe on bo cruz and try to figure out why that one uh, could be the long shot play of the day for tom be sure to check that out on social media channels tomorrow and also on the Today at Keeneland broadcast starting at 11.30 a.m. So that's a look at race number six. Let's move next to the Appalachian Stakes. That's going to be race number seven, and we get a field of uh, 12 in here in the Appalachian Stakes. This is a race over the years where Mark Cassie's had some really good luck. He trains a couple in here. He's got number 10, Pounce, and number three, Danton and Dixie. In the last eight years, Cassie's won this race three times. I think he's got a shot to do it again. Pounce comes off a really nice win where he kind of jumped in the race about the eighth pole down at Gulfstream to win the Here Comes the Bride. Again, where these Gulfstream horses are being played on the turf, you know, maybe in the maiden races, maybe in the allowance races, they don't stack up. But what we saw today in the stakes races, they sure did. So the upper level races at Gulfstream should hold their form, I would assume. And Pounce comes off a really good race uh, down in Gulfstream. Dancing and Dixie, the other for Cassie, is a horse coming off a race at Tampa Bay Downs last time out uh, with a good third place finish another florida horse in here that i give a shot to is the one poolside with slim highly impressive two starts back winning on the synthetic that form was just okay when he went to tampa when she went to tampa last time and kind of disappointed that day when she made the lead and looked like she was home free and wound up fourth but on the inside with Brian Hernandez and some speed, she can save ground, cut all the corners, give poolside with slim a chance in here on the front end uh, to take him a long way. But I think pounce is the horse to beat with that late run, trying to give Cassie his fourth win in the Appalachian stakes uh, in the last nine years. Other handicappers across the way here in race number seven uh, pounce is picked on top by myself and Scott poolside with slim top pick in here for Gabby. And then last year's stakes winner, Buku is a horse uh, back here at Keeneland after winning the Jessamine last year at two. She'll try to win the Appalachian at three. I think two other Phillies in recent years have done that. Uh, Lock Cornell being one of them off the top of my head. And then rushing fall, I think was the other uh, to do that. It's happened. Buku is back. Phil Bauer trains. Bauer had a nice winner on the card today. And 
Uh, hasn't started many in 2024, but they've all come out running. So you got to respect the nine in here, Buku. Give that one a shot. Uh, uh, so a good-looking addition of the Appalachian Stakes. You've got some options and some places to go. 10 over to 139. Feels like you got it kind of covered with my picks and using the picks of the other handicappers across the way. Uh, maybe a place to play a trifecta key. Uh, 10 over to 139 might be something uh, to look at on you know a, a rather reasonable ticket here in uh, race number seven. Let's go to the eighth race. Next up on the card, race number eight is the Madison Stakes. Madison Stakes, grade one for the sprinters on the main track, the Phillies and Mares. Uh, this is also part of the late pick four. There's an additional pick four. So race seven starts an all stakes pick four. That's not a misprint. And then race number eight is going to start another pick four, which is your traditional late pick four, the final four races on the card. Madison Stakes doesn't have Goodnight Olive anymore. She's out of the racing game. So who passes or who gets the baton passed to her uh, in this edition of the Madison Stakes? Vava and Alva Star, they ran one, two last year in Stakes Company here at Keeneland against straight three year olds in the Raven Run. Now they're taking on older horses, and sometimes that can be a step up in class. But these two look highly legitimate. Alva Star's already had a start this year against Elders, and she looked awfully good as for the first start of the year for Vava. Will she be ready to go first time back? If she is, and she runs back to that race in the Raven Run, I think she's the winner in here. Let's go back and take a look at last year's Raven Run, Vava and Alva Star to the top of the stretch. She's fifth. Lily Poo is in sixth. And Apple Picker last. They turn for home. Alva Star, the leader. Vava comes to the outside and then Dazzling Blue out in the center of the track is in third. Here comes Vava trying to chase down Alva Star. And the battle is on, moving by the eighth pole. Alva Star maintains the lead by a length. Vava's there in second. Alva Star, Vava still trying. Still there on the outside. Final furlong of the Lexus Raven run. Vava right alongside of Alva Star. It is Vava Alva, John Velasquez to win the Lexus Raven run by a half length over Alva Star. So Raven run picks across the way. I've got Vava on top, and I'm on an island, which I'm a little surprised with. And Vava's not getting a lot of love from the other handicappers in here. This is a race where we've got a lot of different options, according to the public handicappers, which can be a good thing if you're a better. There's not going to be a standout favorite in here. Alva Star, top pick for Scott. Red Carpet Ready, one coming up from Gulfstream. Winner of the Here Comes the Birdie Stakes last out. Gets Luis Sai as an ace jockey in seven furlong races at Keeneland. Certainly that will help the cause for Red Carpet Ready. Sai is great percentage and great ROI in these seven furlong races at Keeneland. So you got to watch the two in here, Red Carpet Ready. Uh, one that is picked on top by Kim and also by Tom. And then Hot and Sultry, the three. There's the island for Gabby Gaudet. See tomorrow on the program while she's got... Her husband, Norm's horse, picked on top. She doesn't do that often. So uh, find out why she likes hot and sultry to win uh, the uh, Madison Stakes. Grade one there. Uh, hot and sultry top pick for Gabby Gaudet. Okay, eighth race is in the books. Let's go next to the ninth race on the card. And the ninth is one of my favorite races at Keelan. It's the Shaker Town. Five and a half furlong turf sprint. I love the nature of these races. 13 horse field uh, with the also eligible. 12 with the one also eligible. And you know that I love posts three, four, and five, the power posts in these races. They win about 45 or 41% of the races, even though they have 25% of the field with three of the 12 entrants. It is an advantage to be in posts three, four, and five when you get a full field of 12 here at Keeneland. And I think all three of these horses can run. Uh, Magic Mis or Mischief Magic was a Breeders' Cup winner here in the Juvenile Turf Sprint two years ago. Beer Can Man has run in some of the biggest races in the country uh, when it comes to the uh, turf sprinters. And this is a horse in the Woodford last year, ran a good third uh, behind Arzac, went from the 11 hole, from the 12 last time Beer Can Man. Now with an advantageous post position, one to watch in here. And what about Bad Beat Brian? In this very race, the Shaker Town last year ran second beaten ahead at 40 to 1 by the Breeders' Cup champ Caravelle, gave her everything she wanted. Power posts three, four, and five all have a chance to say something here in the Shaker Town Stakes, and that's the direction that I'm going to make my picks. Uh, I'm going to lean on those horses from those power posts, the three, the four, and the five, and I'm almost on an island with the entire lot of it. So circle the wagons here, see if we can't get a little bingo going. At least one of them on top, if we can get through the pick four, pick five late in the day, getting one of these horses in, that's a plus four for sure. If you look at the other handicappers across the way, Arzak top pick for Scott and 
and for Kim. Uh, our shot picked on top and Coppola. So 10, 11 get a lot of love. Six gets a lot of love. Six, 10, 11. And then you take three, four, five uh, in the power post. And that's kind of the way I had it. I didn't mark my past performances. Four, three, five, six, ten. Those are the five that I would be considering using in this particular spot. Uh, if you want to go deep into the multi-race bets, but I love those power posts. I'm definitely going to take my on top chances intra race with beer can man, bad beat, Brian and magic, uh, mischief magic beer can man. Going to be my top pick in here again, drew the 11 hole and the 12 hole in the last two starts now gets a great post position in post number four, Phil D'Amato trains Flavian Pratt rides. Uh, you got to like the connections there, uh, on that one. If you're looking at these turf sprint races at uh, Keeneland, you're looking for Wesley Ward. You're looking for Joel Rosario statistically. The one thing when you look down over the past performances in this race, uh, you have neither present in the Shaker Town. There is no Wesley Ward to default to. There is no Joel Rosario to default to. We'll see that on Sunday in a turf sprint, but not in the Shaker Town on Saturday. Three, four, five. Let's go with the power posts. Uh, in race number nine. Tenth race on the card is the Bluegrass Stakes. Toyota Bluegrass, a mile and an eighth. Uh, one of the most telltale preps towards the Kentucky Derby. But horses who win the Bluegrass haven't had success in the Derby since Strike the Gold in 1991. But we've seen horses come out of here and run well over the years. The Bluegrass has produced the second most Kentucky Derby winners. Only the Florida Derby has produced more. I believe 23 have come out of the Bluegrass, 25 out of the Florida Derby after Mage's victory from Florida last year. So 25, 23, it's time for the Bluegrass maybe to close that in in this year's Kentucky Derby chase. Of course, uh, we will see how it shakes out with Fierceness winning the Florida Derby. Florida's got the edge again coming back to Kentucky the way it would look uh, with Fierceness looking so dominant in the Florida Derby a week or so ago. So uh, let's see how it plays out in a couple weeks in Louisville, but we got to find the winner of the bluegrass stakes first. Uh, we're going to get a little extra uh, bonus coverage in this particular spot because, uh, Tom caught up with, uh, I believe this was Tom. Yeah. Uh, with the, uh, bluegrass or no, this is from Jenny Reese from the Kentucky HBPA, uh, her, um, communications, uh, uh, the, what the, uh, uh, pardon me. The, the communications director there for the Kentucky HBPA, Jenny Reese, the Hall of Fame turf writer. Uh, she puts videos up on the YouTube channel and social media for the HBPA. So uh, we talked, uh, we checked in with one of her talks yesterday. Uh, Brad Cox talked about his uh, stakes horses for the bluegrass with Jenny earlier this week, those being just a touch and Encino. So uh, here's that interview, and then we'll come back and do a little more handicapping on the bluegrass. Brad, just a touch going in the bluegrass stakes. Um, off just uh, two races, a maiden win, sprint, and then second in the the Gotham. Talk about him and the step he's taken. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a very talented horse. He's kind of showed talent from day one. Um, come out of a two-year-old sale. A little late to get to the races, but kind of by design. Um, covers a lot of ground. Good moving horse. Um, real classy to deal with. So I think we're in a good spot. Really like, we've kind of targeted the bluegrass for a while. But the race in New York made sense for him. Raced a little wide there. I see some good figures, and I think he can build off of it. And he's had two works over King, they've been really, really good. Well, we know the entries, mm -hmm. and it's going to have two of the best three year olds, the most accomplished three year olds mm -hmm. in um, Doorknock, the, the Remsen and Fountain mm -hmm. Youth winner, and in the Risen Star mm -hmm. winner in uh, Sierra Leone. Talk about taking on those horses. Well, obviously, they got a little bit more seasoning um, after the races a little earlier, but you know, this horse, I, mean, I think he's one of the you know, one of our better three-year-olds, and, um, you know, I'm excited about, you know, running against those Colts, and hopefully we can stack up with them. Um, obviously, it is, once again, it is a step up. It's a grade one. It's a real grade one. I mean, it's a very, very good race. Um, looks to be one of the better derby preps uh, run so far, and, or could be. So we'll see how uh, he stacks up with that. that yeah. So you've got Encino, who won mm -hmm. the Bataglia. Mm -hmm. He is making his fourth career start and his first on dirt. Yeah, yeah. He's had a couple works over there at Keeneland. He seems to be traveling well. We actually picked him up last fall. He went directly to Turfway, so we didn't have any experience with him on the dirt, but he had trained on the dirt prior to coming to us and trained well enough. So, um, like I said, he's had two moves over there at Keeneland. He handled it fine. Uh, you never really know. Obviously, he is drawn outside. He did draw outside in the uh, Bataglia as well, and he's able to overcome that. Uh, but he's a horse that definitely improved over the last few months um, and, and seems to be getting better than you know, just with, with training and racing and uh, moving forward. Uh, so, you know, he, he's uh, bred to get get the distance and handle the dirt. We'll see if he can. Why was he at, at Turfway? That's just where he, start. we, he started. He was in Lexington training at Thurber Training Center. 
and he shipped to us, and that's where we where, <laughs> where we just made sense. Yeah, yeah, made made sense, and um, got him going, and he did nothing wrong on the synthetic, so he didn't change anything. And, you know, we're, we're gonna give him an opportunity on dirt. We, you know, we've had several horses start on the synthetic. The idiomatic started on the synthetic and transferred over to the dirt. So, you know, just because they run well on one surface doesn't mean they're married to it and they have to uh, stay there. So the field for the Toyota Bluegrass, a field of 11, and Sino for Brad Cox, going to break from that far outside post. Just to his inside is Sierra Leone. The horse until about a week ago was the favorite for the Kentucky Derby until Fierceness took that mantle back. Sierra Leone, of course, the winner of the Risen Star Stakes, and he and Doorknock, the four in here, have a little bit of a rivalry going back to last year's Remsen where they finished on the wire together in a one-two finish. This is a deep and good edition of the breeder, of the uh, Bluegrass. Just a touch, a rising star potentially for Brad Cox. Like he said there in the interview, they always thought this was one of their best three-year-olds. He's already got the Louisiana Derby winner chasing freedom uh, in the Kentucky Derby field. So uh, you've got a Brad Cox barn that typically will have more than one option to the Kentucky Derby. And if Just a Touch runs it as well as many think, he could be a second entrant for that barn uh, in the run for the Roses. Here are the picks for the uh, Bluegrass across the way from the Handicapper Selectors box in here. Just a Touch, the top pick for Scott, Gabby, and Tom. They are in on the Brad Cox trainee in this particular spot. Sierra Leone is the top choice for me and also for Kim Nelson. Amongst the others underneath Everybody gives Doorknock some respect. Get him in there somewhere. Tom Leach caught up with his trainer, Danny Gargan, to talk about where they might be in this particular race. Doorknock is a horse who went wire to wire pretty much uh, in some of his other starts, but there could be a change of tactics. Here's Tom Leach with Danny Gargan. Danny Gargan's got Doorknock in the grade one Toyota Bluegrass Stakes. I saw an interview with you earlier this winter where you talked about your plan to get into the Derby and just steady progression of improvement how is he on schedule for you i think we've done everything right i think we've made a lot of right decisions and uh, i think we're in the right race and uh, hopefully it's the right time i mean he's going to run a big race uh we're blessed that we don't have to worry about points uh so we're going to try to sit off the pace this time and stock and uh see how he runs doing that he's been training well sitting behind horses and uh, we'd like to see him uh sit second or third and hopefully make a big run in the stretch this time. Are you looking for that rating with an eye toward the next step? I mean, like I said, we're in the Derby now. I mean, we'd love to win the Bluegrass. It'd be a big, you know, big feather in his cap, you know, to make him a grade one winner being a full by Mage, which actually Puka had a full brother to him last night, a beautiful baby. Mr. Stewart was here this morning. We're blessed that he stopped by to see him and uh, Gavin. And, uh, you know, it'd be great if he wins, but the, the future goal is the Derby. We want to try to get him you know, as much education in this race to set him up for his next race. What is his most impressive quality? The good ones have something that makes him special. Uh, he just trains, you know, the way he does everything is, he does everything so naturally and so easy. And uh, he's just a real fun horse to have. He's a, you know, big, beautiful horse. And it's just been a blessing that we have him. That race in the, the Remsen, you see horses sometimes get headed. But I mean, he got past maybe half a length and then to come back, uh, did that show you something different in him? Well, Louis rode him that day, and uh, Louis said when he hit the rail, he kind of lost his momentum and stopped running. So it's a little deceiving. I don't know if he was coming back. Louis says he just got back to running the speed he was running, and it just took him a minute to gather himself after hitting the rail. I don't think, uh, I, you know, it's. I mean, it's pretty impressive how he came back, and it was. I mean, to be able to to hit the rail and then be able to win the race. After going 46, 11, going, you know, it's a deep track. I thought the whole race was crazy, crazy impressive by both horses. You know, Sierra Leone ran a monster race from last to catch catch up with us. So it's just great for Kingland to have these two horses running here and uh, to showcase the bluegrass as uh, one of the best derby preps in the country. And that Derby prep will be part of the big three, pick three, Keeneland participating along with Aqueduct and Santa Anita. The Wood Memorial, Bluegrass, and Santa Anita Derby all combined in a pick three wager, $3 minimum, 18% takeout, the big three, pick three. Uh, you play it as a separate wagering event if you're playing through your ADW, if you're on track, ask for the big three, pick three. Uh, who might we use in this race uh, for the bluegrass, for the blue, uh, for that big three, pick three? I think you definitely want to use Sierra. 
Sierra Leone. I think that's the top one, just a touch, obviously. The other handicappers have a strong opinion of that one. I would be surprised if it gets beyond too deep in here, honestly. I don't think Doorknock's going to have success rating in this particular spot. I watched his workout at XBTV, and he could not get to a workmate uh, while coming from off of it and trying to sit. I didn't like what I saw there uh, in that video. So if they're trying to rate and they're trying to teach him for the Kentucky Derby, wonderful. I think that's great training. I think they're going to be better down the road for that because you just don't get your way in the Kentucky Derby. And that's what prep races are for. But for winning on Saturday and betting it, what will probably be second, third choice uh, on the tote. I think door knock will be an underlay for his chances to win it here. I would heavily lean on Sierra Leone on top with just the touch as the other horse maybe who can pull off the victory in here. I've got Encino for my exact. I think Encino is going to come running at the end and be a part of it as far as betting that horse on top. Top, though in the multi-race wagers or in a race like that big or in a bet like that big three pick three i wouldn't use horses like encino or door knock in the first spot i haven't picked second and third in this particular race but i think the most likely winners in this race are sierra leone rallies and wins it or the brilliance of the stretch out miler just the touch is too much for this one so that's the way i see the bluegrass states let's go to the uh, final race on this 11 race card we've got a super high five carryover in the 11th race of eleven thousand three. 20. The Keelan Turf pick three also wraps up in this particular spot. Now, this isn't a huge field, a field of eight here in Allowance Company. Uh, this turf allowance race really, to me, comes down to two horses. It's either 3-5 or 5-3. Running B and Masterpiece, they're classy. Uh, they, they should be horses that just fit in this spot for high percentage connections. you got Chad Brown and Rick Dutro teaming up here. I've got Masterpiece on top. A horse comes from pretty far out of it. Uh, running B should have the first on that one. Uh, I can't see going any more than too deep in this particular spot, nor can any of the other handicappers. This is as straightforward a grid as you're going to see on the entire card. 3-5, 5-3, 5-3, 6 5 and 3 5. Everybody's got the 3 5 in some uh, uh, shape or form. The 6 of credit is going to be the upset pick by Gabby in this particular spot. Uh, tune in tomorrow to see why she does not have running B anywhere in her top three. Uh, and uh, maybe she make a great case for a credit and it would sway you in that direction. But the way I see the race, it's 3 5 or 5 3. Don't think it's a great betting race to finish up the day. So I think you want to kind of, you know, Strike early if you can. I, I when we get to the uh, bluegrass stakes, I like you know Sierra Leone, who's probably going to be favorite or second choice in there. I think Just a Touch is a horse who's going to get bet as well. I think we've got a chalky last two races on the card, and in that bluegrass stakes, an interesting stat about that one: the last six winners of the bluegrass have been two to one or less. So there haven't been prices to be found in that race. It has been very true to form, and I expect that again. I think the two wagering choices in there at post time will be Sierra Leone and Just the Touch. I think Doorknock will be third choice in the betting in there. One of those two favorites, I think, probably takes home the Bluegrass Stakes. That's going to wrap up this edition of the uh, Keeneland Look Ahead podcast. Reminder, $66,000 carryover in the pick six, $11,000 carryover in the super high five. You got Kentucky Derby Future Wagering that's available tomorrow at ADW Outlets and on track at Keeneland if you're playing there. A lot of great options to play. Five stakes races tomorrow. A fantastic day of racing all around the country, but especially right here in the bluegrass at Keeneland. So on behalf of everybody at Keeneland, and I'm Jeremy Plunk from Horse Player. Now I want to wish you a great Saturday. I'll be back Saturday night to preview the Sunday card where the Beaumont Stakes is featured on Sunday as we wrap up closing weekend. Have a great night, everybody. Talk to you tomorrow, and best of luck at the races.